So as we hit the hour, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Adriano Camps from the uh, Universidad Politecnica de Catalonia in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, and he's gonna be talking to us about three decades of remote sensor development at the university uh, from ground-based instruments to CubeSat payloads. So thank you very much for making time uh, and for supporting this webinar, which is now starting to hit every month, especially if someone volunteers for next month. With that, take it away. Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind invitation okay, to, to be here and uh, be able to present you what we have been doing, especially in the topics of uh, passive microwaves here in the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya in Barcelona, Spain. I'm also affiliated with the Institute de Estudios Espaciales de Catalunya, and since uh, September this year, so a couple of months ago, with the UAE University in Alain as a visiting international professor. So the outline of this presentation is the following. For those of you that are not uh, very familiar with, I will just uh, briefly introduce what uh, the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya is, our remote, uh, our group, research group, uh, the Consens Lab, which basically encompasses uh, things related to communications and remote sensing. Then I will give a brief, very brief introduction on basically the remote sensing activities and with a special focus on the passive microwave uh, remote sensing activities, microwave radiometers, GNSS uh, reflectometry, and RFI detection and mitigation. And then the second half of the presentation will be devoted to the activities that we have been conducting since the uh, year 2007 related to CubeSats. And I put this uh, finding our own way because uh, there are many, many things that have been done and uh, we try to basically to look for in which we could perform the best, okay? This is our way. And I will introduce uh, later the, the program, the missions that we have been conducted and the ones that we are conducting right now. And then I will conclude. That's great. Uh, a couple of people in the chat are commenting still that it's a little quiet. So I guess we're, we just have a quiet connection this time. You sound great to me, uh, but I, I guess, you know, trying to speak up a little or get a little closer to okay. the mic. Oh, yeah, that, that surely has fixed it. That's great. Okay, let me see if now. Yeah. See, isn't it not? <laughs> what about this now? It sounds great to me. It also sounds louder to me. So my, my hope would be that it's okay. also louder for the yeah. others. I will try to also to speak a little bit louder. Sounds great. Thank you. Okay, no problem. So, I mean, the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya, uh, it was established in 1971, okay, as the Universidad Politecnica de Barcelona. We are in Barcelona, but actually the university has uh, nine campuses. We are in the north uh, east part of Spain. So here, you know, you can see my cursor uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. And in Campus North, which is uh, here, for those of you that are fans of uh, soccer, we are on the other side of where the soccer field of Barcelona is, okay? We have uh, the schools of telecommunications engineering, uh, the school of informatics and civil engineering, all at uh, Campus North. And we have also some buildings that are de devoted to uh, basically research centers and companies uh, working with, closely with UPC, spin-off, et cetera. Uh, our school, we belong to the School of Telecommunications, okay, engineering, and uh, in the rankings, in the, in the Shanghai ranking, we are between one and two in Spain, 39, 52 in Europe, in the world, 151 to 200, but in the QS uh, ranking, I don't know which one is better, actually, there are so many, I mean, in the world, we are around the 52. Our uh, group, so, which is uh, part of the Department of Signal Theory and Communications, uh, focuses on the research on antennas, microwaves, radar and remote sensing, and optical communications. And I would say that until the year, basically around 1990, uh, it was mostly focused on at subsystems, so antennas, microwave, and things like that. And it was with the turn, and almost simultaneously in time with the first European remote sensing satellite, that a number of uh, research lines on uh, remote sensing, notably synthetic aperture radar, microwave radiometry, and LIDAR were started. And uh, from that point, the, all the activities uh, kick off and grow to, to the point where it is now. 
We are about uh, 25 uh, faculty members. Uh, number of postdocs uh, varies and PhD students and masters, maybe another 20 to 25, more or less, it varies. We, our research activities are organized in seven uh, lines, okay? Developing uh, key enabling technologies that map into 11 strategic lines, antenna and radio systems, free space optical communications, microwave systems, and then within the remote sensing lab, optical remote sensing, active microwave remote sensing, passive microwave remote sensing. And the latest one is the UPC NanoSat lab, okay? And I will be talking about these two activities because all the NanoSat lab activities are mostly related to passive microwave remote sensors. We try to align our key ETs to the UN SDGs. And uh, in 2017, we were awarded with the Maria de Maez II uh, Distinction of Excellence, Research Excellence from the Spanish government. So going to the things that we do, for in, the, in the field of antennas and radio systems, we have an anechoic chamber that goes from one to 40 kilohertz, six times six times 10 meters. And here is basically where uh, the antenna systems that we use in, of course, in the remote sensors, but also in other uh, applications are tested, okay? Other applications that are more specific to, to antennas, anti-collision radars, 5G MIMO antennas for uh, cars, uh, bio radars, and then coming closer to the bio field, okay? There was a, a sensor that was uh, invented here and that was used, uh, I mean, it's the, the, the key product of a company called MiWendo, okay? That helps to detect uh, colon cancer in a less intrusive way. And there is another uh, development, okay? That allow to evaluate the uh, stent for stenosis, okay, in vivo. So I mean, in case you, you need to, they, they, need, they get broken, they need to be changed. In terms of uh, reconfigurable microwave systems, uh, circuit design, uh, integrated uh, technologies, uh, chips for small, uh, light, lightweight, uh, efficient transmission reception using different technologies, high data rate, short distance, millimeter wave, flexible communications, and in general, everything that deals with the miniaturization of the uh, microwave uh, systems. So these two, antennas and microwave systems, as you can imagine, are the building blocks of the remote sensors. And I mentioned that uh, three different research lines on optical remote sensing, LIDAR, notably, uh, synthetic aperture radar and microwave radiometry is started at the beginning of the year, uh, of the decade of the 90s. And in this slide, I showed you a little bit the development on LIDAR, atmospheric LIDAR. Here are some plots of uh, basically, uh, you see the, the I mean, uh, the, the, I say the boundary layer, okay, and how it evolves uh, over time. This is in collaboration uh, with uh, uh, researchers from the University of Massachusetts, Purdue, and Minoa. And this is another project that I'm particularly, uh, uh, I think it's worth uh, showing, but because I mean, it's 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 connecting to the to the to the economic world, and it has uh, implications. So this buoy that you see here on the bottom left, it's a buoy that is equipped with a 3D wind lidar scanner that allows to make a, a map of the wind fields uh, over height with different heights, and this is used. Uh, this was designed in the framework of this EU peak energy project. And this is the product that led to the foundation of this startup, EOLOS. And this, uh, these winds, uh, over, uh, wind maps uh, with height are used to uh, locate the best place to put the aerogenerators and at which height the propeller has to be. So, I mean, uh, this is a, I mean, the, the, this boy is expensive, but it's far, far cheaper than all other means that were used before. In the field of active microwave remote sensing, uh, there are people in the team doing uh, processing. Here is an example of uh, Gaufen 3 data processing, just to put an example of something that is a little bit different from the classical uh, European 
satellites. Here's another example of subsidence of the Barcelona airport after the new terminal one uh, was built. It's very close to the coast and it was sinking during the first uh, years after the construction. And then on remote sensors that are manufactured here at home in our lab, I mean, we have uh, ground-based SARS, okay, that uh, are used to sense uh, deformations of the structures as the cars pass through the bridge, for example. And then other examples of a, uh, a SAR that is mounted in a drone or in a remote control aircraft uh, with all the avionics and all other sensors. And this is an example of an image acquired with this, uh, this plane over here. Okay, other examples of GBSAR and applications, landslide monitoring in Andorra, which is a small country between, in the Pyrenees between uh, Spain and France, or again, displacement monitoring in the Montserrat uh, mountain range, okay, which is a mountain range uh, not too far away, like 40 kilometers away from Barcelona. And it's very unstable. So it's, uh, there was a project with the cartographic Institute to monitor the displacement uh, of the rocks. And now entering into the field of uh, remote sensing, passive microwave remote sensing. We started the activities back to the year 1993. And we started with uh, something that later became the instrument, which is uh, this three, this array formed by three arms with 69 uh, antenna elements, okay? Which is the MIRAS instrument on board of the ESA ESMOS mission. SMOS stands for soil moisture and ocean salinity. During almost one decade, we focus on the development of the instrument concept, the analysis of the performance, uh, working with companies to, to establish uh, uh, lay the, <coughs> the, the specifications for the different subsystems, etc. In the year 2000, after some experiments that I will show you later, we came to the conclusion that we need to do something to correct for the effect of surface roughness when trying to do the salinity retrievals for SMOS. And this is how we started our activities on GNSS reflectometry. More or less in the same time, SMOS uh, was approved, actually in the year uh, 1999, SMOS was approved as an ESA mission. Okay, and then we kept working uh, in image reconstruction algorithms, calibration, we developed this simulator for ESA and in conjunctions with uh, Deimos. And we also conducted field experiments in order to develop uh, sea salinity and uh, soil moisture um, retrieval algorithms. And in the year 2007, we started the last epoch, if you want, of the lab with the CubeSat related activities and some other activities related to RFI detection and mitigation. Some examples, okay, so this is a, a millimeter weight uh, uh, radiometer used to make images and detect uh, even plastic, in this case is a toy gun, okay, under the, the clothes of a, of a person. And in other missions that we have worked is uh, for the Sentinel-3 uh, radiometer electronic unit. And now we are working with uh, one of the companies that is manufacturing the receivers uh, here in Spain, uh, basically to consult with them and provide uh, support in the specification and testing. And in the bottom here, you see another sort of uh, Y-shaped instrument. This is a fully digital synthetic aperture interferometric radiometer prototype that we developed, trying to see how a second generation of a small instrument would be if we were able to do everything digital. So filtering, IQ then conversion, etc. because SMOS, even though it was launched in 2009, the technologies, the design of the receivers, et cetera, it's from the late 90s. So, I mean, this is what happens in these uh, big missions. I mean, the technology that is flying is a technology that was uh, used 10 years ago, uh, before or even 15 years before uh, during all the development phase, okay? So th that was a, a nice exercise of uh, looking forward into the future. Okay, this, uh, this has never become a, a, a spaceborne instrument, but we had uh, lots of fun. Okay, so after this overview, our two main research areas have focused on uh, micro radiometry, and in particular, interferometric, synthetic aperture interferometric radiometry, 
and GNSSR. In the field of uh, interferometric radiometry, we started, as I said, uh, with the instrument, but then we start shifting also into the applications. And this was done in collaboration with the Institute of Marine Sciences, at that time led by Professor Jordi Fon, who was the co-principal uh, investigator of the ESMOS mission. He was in charge of all the salinity aspects or the ocean aspects, okay? And uh, we support the development of sea salinity uh, retrieval algorithms, overland soil moisture algorithms, and we develop downscaling algorithms to achieve one kilometer uh, spatial resolution by merging, combining this uh, SMOS data together with the MODIS data and other data coming from, from models, notably from ECMWF. And in some cases, as I'm showing here in the, in the central panel, okay, even to 250 meters. And in one occasion, we did it up to down to 30 meters. But I, I cannot say that this is an operational product because then the downscaling starts uh, falling. But easily we can do one kilometer and actually we produce this one kilometer daily over the European continent. We also develop sea ice thickness uh, products and fire risk uh, indices over the Iberian Peninsula that we are actually deliver every season or in the summer season to the regional authorities to do the, basically the, the management of the fire. And then they said in the year, around the year 2000, we start working in GNSS reflectometry. For those of you that are not uh, fully familiar with uh, this technique, we pick in a receiver, in this case, it's in a, a small satellite, the direct and the reflected signal. So if we compare the transit times between the direct and the reflected in both the downwelling and the upwelling paths, we can get information on the height of the surface where the reflection is taking place. So this is for altimetry applications. And if we compare the powers, of course, with the proper compensation of the antenna patterns, then we can get information on the reflection coefficient. Because the frequency that is used is uh, basically the GPS or Galileo L1 E1, 1.57 uh, gigahertz, is very close to the band that is reserved for passive observations in, at L band, the one that is used by SMOS, which is 1.4 uh, gigahertz. The reflectivity is also sensitive to to the roughness, but it's sensitive to the soil moisture, it's sensitive to the vegetation water content, and so on and so forth. So actually, both techniques are uh, complementary and they match uh, very well. Here are some more details on the activities uh, related to microwave radiometry, related to SMOS, support to the industry, developing the receivers, and at that time it was called EADIS CASA, now it's uh, Airbus uh, military and defense in Madrid, uh, developing the instrument, developing the, sim the, the SMOS and twin performance simulator, numerical mo emission models of the ocean and vegetation. And this is something that I was uh, really proud of because this was uh, the Laura radiometer, okay? That at that time in the year 2000, it was the very first uh, fully polarimetric L1 radiometer that we deployed in the Casablanca oil rig and uh, provide uh, I think useful measurements, okay, to develop the emissivity uh, models that we are used later uh, for the retrieval of the salinity in the ESMOS mission. We also conducted other experiments over land, okay, to assess the different uh, effects that affect the emissivity. And in the end, all these was used in the development of uh, retrieval algorithms. Here's another example of an instrument. It's an L1 radiometer that was used in conjunction with the CASI instrument from the cartographic, uh, Catalan Cartographic Institute, okay, in a Cessna caravan uh, plane. And this is the example of the downscaling that we applied for SMOS, but now from this plane, so we had a footprint uh, from the radiometer that was uh, 200 meters, and we were able to downscale it down to uh, a couple of meters. And here you have the, the full map. But this is in over Gimanes in data, uh, west of uh, Barcelona, and this is in Salamanca, in the Remedus Calval, Calval site that is for, or was used for SMOS. 
And another thing that I'm proud of is that these technologies are now being uh, manufactured, okay? They are products of another spin-off company called Balance. More instruments, uh, PAU Real Aperture. This uh, 16 element array, okay, was, uh, I mean, I think it was one of the first ones also introducing uh, digital beamforming. Actually, it created a couple of beams that were able to, to be steered automatically without need to move the antenna itself. Okay, and this is the uh, synthetic aperture version of the PAU instrument. And I will show you something that was really interesting because when doing the calibration, the pointing to the Senate, we start seeing some dots. We were not sure what these dots were. Actually, we thought these were errors and not. They turned to be GPS satellites moving over the sky, but as seen by this synthetic aperture radiometer, because to simplify the receiver, we use front ends uh, from uh, tune at uh, the GPS band. This is MediChain, okay. Uh, an instrument, okay, a multi-frequency radiometer with uh, covering all the bands from 1.4 up to uh, 89 gigahertz. And we use that also to develop uh, RFI. In the field of uh, GNSSR, in the year 2001, again, we started one year before, but in the year 2001, we delivered to the Institute of Space Sciences uh, the first uh, GNSS instrument that we designed and the first that was uh, owned by them. It was uh, it had three channels and it record the up looking signal and the left and right down looking signals into a an, uh, hard drive that could be a removable one. Then we developed the first uh, degree power instrument which produced complex DVMs in real time. So each of the photograms that you see in this uh, in this movie, this is real data. Okay, each photogram corresponds to one millisecond of data. So every millisecond, we were able to already generate one of these uh, delayed Doppler maps. Okay, and then all the data was stored and the processing was done online. All these developments led to the PAU instrument that was uh, ready to be flown in a, an INTA. INTA is the Spanish uh, Aerospace uh, Institute. But the mission was canceled uh, due to the economic crisis of 2008. So, I mean, it's still in my, in my office. And we developed other instruments, ground-based like the Smigol or the Largo, which was a miniature uh, GNSS receiver that you could put in a, in a car or in a small plane or even in a, in a sort of uh, parapet. And this is our jewel of the crown. Uh, with respect to GNSS uh, reflectometry, which is the MIR instrument with uh, two beams at two frequencies. So four beams looking up, four beams looking down with electronic beam steering, okay? And also with the compensation of the attitude of the plane. So basically the system automatically selects which satellites it had to track. It compensates for the attitude of the plane, point the beams towards the satellite, and compute also the, the, the direction of the beams for the specular reflection points. Now here you have some examples of measurements in Australia, because we, we did uh, the test flights uh, in the Janko region, and also performing some flights between uh, Australia and Tasmania. And we have used, I mentioned that the GNSS signals are also sensitive to, to the vegetation water content. So we developed some ground-based instruments also to measure the vegetation opacity. So here you have a polar plot and there is uh, all the leaves are present. And then in winter time or in the late spring, okay, when uh, there is no, no, no leaves, okay, so the signal that is received is stronger. And this correlates actually with the NDVI, but it also correlates with the vegetation water content. And now getting a little bit closer to the CubeSats, okay, we tested also some of the instruments that uh, we flew later in our CubeSats in uh, some stratospheric balloon flights. And this is the Picaro instrument that was the, the heart of uh, CubeCat2 uh, satellite. And that was the, tested in uh, Vexus uh, 19 and actually Vexus 17 as well. But in the second flight, okay, we were able to operate it and get uh, 
dual frequency, L1 and L2, GPS, GLONASS, and Galileo reflected signals at two polarizations. So that was a, a very nice uh, experiment. All these signals peak from 30 kilometers k. And I mentioned that in the year 2000, we moved uh, or we start our activities on GNSSR also because we start uh, encountering lots of RFP, radio frequency interference in these ground based or uh, experiments or the ones in the, in the oil rig. Frankly, we were hoping that RFI will be less important in the GNSS bands, but that was not the case. So we, we found ourselves uh, that basically the, the work that we wanted to do was very much uh, difficult. So we had to uh, develop uh, another system that we call Phoenix, okay, that we put between the antenna and any receiver or any GNSS receiver that basically cleans the signal and delivers a clean signal to the receiver, but preserving the navigation information so that the receiver at the output can decode the navigation signal, or if it is a GNSS reflectometer, it can perform the, uh, the proper processing. So here you have an example with the jammer off and the uh, canceller off as well. So you see no RFI in the time domain. So this is the time domain. The center in this one is in the frequency domain. When the jammer is on, but Phoenix is off, you see lots of uh, RFI in the time domain. And also in the frequency domain, you maybe you can barely see that there is a bump over here. But all the satellites stop being tracked. And when the system, the anti jammer, is activated, the signal is much cleaner. In the frequency domain, it has almost disappeared. And despite the C and C log has decreased, the system still works. So basically, we gain between 20 and 30 dB resilience in front of RFI. And now, the second part of this presentation, uh, I will introduce the, the UPC NanoSatla and basically how we have been able to integrate all the activities, remote sensing activities, into our current uh, CubeSat missions. So the first question that people ask is, why people in the School of Telecommunications Engineering do nanosatellites? I mean, this should be in the aeronautics school. Why is it? Well, look, the CubeSats nowadays and the small satellites and the bigger satellites as well have most of it, I would say more than 80% is information and communication technologies. It's not, you don't have propellers, you don't have uh, other things that planes or have. So we wanted also to test novel Earth observation payloads that uh, otherwise it's very difficult to find a large mission uh, to, to put in. Also, over time, we start uh, working in IoT and satellite communications, mostly related to the operation of the uh, sensors in situ, on ground, and in space. And uh, CubeSats are also a good tool to test them. We started uh, here in the Omega-3 building, the year 2007. In the year 2013, when we wanted to install the shaker, we moved from this building to this one here. And then when we uh, put or we installed the uh, ISO 17 room, we moved to our current emplacement or place, which is in the building C4 in Campus North. In parallel, we have developed the ground station. In the year 2012, it was in the rooftop of uh, the building uh, B3. Okay, but when we were about to launch our first uh, satellite, Cubeta 2, the level of RFI had increased by 18 dB. Okay, so that was uh, really a lot. We had lots of problems. So here you have an example of the, of the signal and the RFI. Uh, these radio amateur signals, are, sorry, bands, are not respected at all. We had lots of problems with uh, taxi drivers and so on. So in the end, we decide that we had to move. And in the year 2018, in preparation for the FSS mission, we migrate the s dish and the UHF and VHF uh, antennas into an uh, astronomic observatory that is uh, at 1.6 kilometers height, very far away from the civilization. So the electromagnetic environment is very clean and the reception of the signal is uh, very, very neat. 
So what is a CubeSat? For those of you that uh, are not very familiar with, I mean, we are, uh, uh, the CubeSat is a, a standard or a de facto standard, okay, that was conceived in the year uh, 1999, okay? So, I mean, this is very convenient for us because we are telecommunication engineers. So we want to focus on information uh, theory uh, in our sensors and we don't want, and we don't have the expertise to focus on the mechanical aspects. So we adopted immediately the CubeSat standard and actually our first mission, as I will show you later, was a one unit uh, CubeSat. Nowadays, they are, uh, if you go to the CubeSat design specification document, all the form factors from one to 12 units are specified. And one unit is a cube, okay, of 10 centimeters side. So a six unit CubeSat, it's 10 times 20 times 30 centimeters. And a 12 unit CubeSat, it's 20 times 20 times 30 centimeters, okay? And at the very beginning, there were some companies offering something that was called a CubeSat kit. And I think that was really, really a disaster because many people thought, and, and also companies and uh, governments, that this was like a Lego, okay? That you take the manual, you assemble it, okay? In a couple of afternoons or even less, you already have it. And this is not true. This is not true because, I mean, the amount of engineering that goes into one of these uh, small satellites is huge. They are working with the students. I can tell you, you have tens of students working very hard in a continuous way in order to make it uh, happen. So nowadays, from all these form factors that I presented here, the one that is being dominating the scene is this, the three unit. So 10 times 10 times 30 centimeters, because actually in the year 2013, there were two companies that start deploying their um, satellites, or the satellites that in later became their constellations, okay, using this uh, form factor. On one side, we have a planet that has launched uh, nowadays more than 500 three unit CubeSats with uh, optical payloads. And on the other side, we have a Spire that has launched more than 160 three unit CubeSats also for GNSS radio occultations. If you see the evolution over time until the year 2012, um, the number of CubeSats launched was very, very small. In the year 2013, it starts rocketing. And since then, basically the number of launch has, it's, it's almost exponentially increasing. Of course, with this valley here that was due to, uh, to COVID, okay? That prevented many CubeSats from being launched. And if we pay attention to the applications of the CubeSats, okay, and the small satellites, okay? I will not say uh, Starlink are uh, CubeSats, but they are small satellites, okay? This uh, gentleman has already launched almost 3,000 satellites, okay? But the next one in line is Planet Labs that has launched more than 500 following the 3U form factor and optical payloads. Then again, we have uh, communications, but these are not, okay? These are the small sites. One web is not a, a cube satellite at all. And did you see in number five, in terms of number of satellites, we have Spire, okay? Again, with a three unit CubeSat form of factor. And uh, when it says weather, it's basically the Genesis radio occultations. Okay. And they also have AES receiver, et cetera. There are other uh, companies that use uh, hosted payloads. Okay. And even positioning. So uh, PNT constellations, LEO constellations are coming either based on uh, small satellites or as hosted payloads. Uh, piggybacking on, on other bigger satellites. But if we focus now on, on CubeSats, we see again, planet number one, spire number two. Okay. Here we have this uh, Jilin constellation. Okay. And then satellogic. Here you have the number of satellites that have been launched. In yellow color is optical, multispectral optical uh, sensors. In green color, 
is uh, passive microwaves, but uh, GNSS uh, radio quotations. And in the last uh, few years, they have also included GNSS uh, reflectometry. And in the category of small satellites, okay, but not really uh, a huge set, we have uh, ISI, okay. But again, eh, this is a micro satellite. It's not a, it's not a cubesat. If you focus on cubesats, you will see that basically everybody is doing optical remote sensing, except the spire. So, what are the big ones doing? So NASA has a very very intense uh, and well developed uh, program. Okay, this is not the topic of this um, talk. Okay, but uh, they have tens of uh, cubesats, even some of them that have been used as data relay satellites in the Mars mission, like the Mars Cube 1. ESA is also developing uh, a fleet of CubeSats. These ones, okay, in the ESA technology de um, department. So if they do science, this is good, but uh, it's the technology, the one that is being uh, used to push and to develop uh, these satellite missions. Okay, now, uh, ESA is also developing uh, some, let's say, cheaper and faster missions called the scouts. The scout number two is uh, Cube, Map, Cube Map, which are three satellites. As you can see, this is the form factor of a 12 uh, unit CubeSat. And each of these uh, satellites is carrying four instruments uh, three high resolution infrared occultation spectrometers and an spectral solar disk uh, imager. And the second one, the scout two, uh, is uh, hydro GNSS is not following uh, the CubeSat uh, form factor, but uh, this is for a GNSSR uh, mission. And there is an ESA mission. Actually, I mean, the, the owner is, is us, but uh, we won a contest, the Copernicus Masters competition in the year 2017. And we were also the, the overall uh, winners. And this is this is small. Uh, Twin, uh, well, not twin because they are not identical, okay, but the uh, tandem mission formed by QCAT 5A and B. And this was the first uh, third party mission based on CubeSats contributing to the Copernicus uh, program. Our lab, again, trying to find our way, okay, if you want to purchase the different subsystems, it's very expensive. So, but on the other hand, when you launch, and having a launch is also very expensive. We want to make sure, or at least have some chances that it will work. So we start uh, acquiring a thermal vacuum chamber to do the part of the environmental tests. Then we purchase the shaker, okay? And then uh, over time, again, we pass through these uh, three different locations. We put the ISO 7 uh, clean room. We also develop some helpful coils okay, to test all the attitude determination and control systems and uh, the ground stations, okay, the Montsec Observatory, it's here, it's about uh, two hours and a half away from Barcelona. And these are our CubeSat missions, CubeCat 1, that was launched in November uh, 2018, with seven tech, small tech demos, CubeCat 2, in August 2015, with uh, basically the Picaro payload that I showed you before in the stratospheric balloon experiment. QCAT 3 with a multispectral camera. This mission was canceled due to the, uh, let's say, unstable political situation in Catalonia in the year, around the year 2017. QCAT 4, which is uh, one of our uh, current missions, it undergoes some environmental tests uh, in ESA facilities two weeks ago, and it succeeded. It will carry a deployable antenna that I will show you later. This one over here that will deploy, and when it's extended, is uh, more than half a meter. It includes a GNSSR L1 uh, reflectometer, an L1 microwave radiometer, and an ADS uh, receiver. CubeCat uh, 5A and B, forming the so called uh, FSS CAD mission. Again, I'm very proud of this one because this, as you will see, includes. GNSS reflectometry, microwave radiometry, and hyperspectral imager that we use to combine with the other data to produce downscale products as we have done from planes and for SMOS. 
and it also includes some RFI detection and mitigation algorithms. And because the size of the payloads was smaller than in previous CubeSat missions, there was a space for an RF and optical intersatellite image. These two missions here, six and seven, are in collaboration with uh, uh, NSSTC, the National Space Science and Technology Center of the United Arab Emirates. This one is a three unit uh, CubeSat. Actually, this one, okay, the payloads are sponsored by uh, GRSS uh, through the, one of the student grant challenges. I have to say that my students submitted without me knowing it, okay, and actually uh, the external evaluators ranked it uh, well, and therefore it was selected, but I had nothing to do with, with it. And then we have uh, uh, FMPL3, which is the evolution of the payload that went into CubeSat uh, 5A that will fly in uh, the satellite GNSSAS, again from uh, NSSTC in the UAE. That one will carry an L5 uh, reflectometer and an ionospheric scintillation experiment. And our uh, future mission, CubeCat 8, will include uh, basically a pocket cube deployer. We will be deploying two pocket cubes. It will have an ionic thruster motor in the place of the third pocket cube. It will include also a deployable antenna, okay, uh, for uh, GNSS radio occultations and a polarimetric camera for the polarimetric multispectral camera to look to the aurora. So CubeCat 1, as you can imagine, we, we play with the name. So instead of CubeSats, we put CubeCat, okay, from Catalonia, etc. So it has to be pronounced CubeCat. Uh, we use the 1U form factor. It includes a number of technology demonstrators. Okay, a couple of uh, or three small scientific experiments, a DGA camera to have something to show. Okay, and then again, your data counter, and then another experiment of the effect of plasma in wireless uh, power transfer. Um, this this CubeSat had a, a long history because it had to be launched in the year 2014 and it ended up being launched in the year 2018. Okay, I will not enter into the details of the history because they are a bit tragic. The first uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, and then two failures of uh, Falcon 9. But we ended up being launched uh, from a PSLV uh, rocket from the Indian Space Agency. So this is, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, CubeCat 2 being launched, okay, on August 15, 2016. Here you see the evolution of uh, the Picaro payload occupying three units. This is the up-looking antenna, and this is the nadir-looking array to pick the reflected signal. And this is the time when it was injected in the duo pack. And it was launched together with the quantum satellite that uh, was used to test the first uh, um, quantum key uh, sent by the, I mean, uh, communications uh, between ground and the satellite. That was uh, from, a, from the G Quan uh, ground station um, or launch station in, in China. And here you have uh, CubeCat 4, okay? It's a one unit CubeSat again. In this video, you would see how the antenna is deployed. Let me do it again. So you will see that first, uh, there are four fingers that open, okay? And then the antenna is deployed in two stages. Well, actually in one. And then, uh, I mean, this is the, the different pieces. It will be launched uh, next year, end of next year, in the Ariane 6 uh, maiden flight. And uh, we have to acknowledge all the support uh, from the ESA, ESA Academy, well, formerly the ESA Educational Office. FSS CAT was an innovative uh, mission consisting of two federated CubeSats, 5A and uh, 5B. Here you have the NORAD uh, identificators if you want to track them on Celestrack. The first of the CubeSat included a microwave ra uh, radiometer and a GNSS reflectometer. The second one includes HyperScout 2 from Cosine, a Dutch company. Okay, and between the two of them, okay, there was an RF and an optical intersatellite link. Here are the different uh, contributions from the different partners. In UPC, we propose the mission, we develop the sensor. Now you see that the whole reflectometer is occupying 1.5 units, but actually it fits in one unit. 
okay we are able to to shrink from the three units in qcat2 to one and a half or actually less in uh, qcat5 and actually in qcat2 uh, sorry qcat4 is even smaller okay this is the antenna array the two rf intersatellite links and then the two antennas uhf and uh, s-band Goldbreak space uh, provide the optical intersatellite links, cosine the hyper scout. And one thing that is worth uh, mention here is that hyper scout included this board over here that you see. It was attached at the end, and it includes the so called FISAT 1 experiment. So, FISAT is this board that basically analyzes the images and detects uh, the presence of clouds. So, if the image is too cloudy, it can be discarded before downloading it uh, to ground because it takes uh, uh, a resource that is the bandwidth that is very scarce and it's not worth uh, downloading uh, images that will be useless. We have Deimos in Portugal that was uh, de that developed the data processing ground segment and basically uh, it reused uh, experience from previous projects in which uh, we have uh, participated because. Uh, uh, the one the director of, of earth observation wanted us to develop all these mission in and implement it in one year we ended up doing it one year and a half uh, it was really really a nightmare so we had to basically look for companies uh, basically taking care of the platforms etc and that company was uh, Taiwan international based in, in italy okay that basically provide the platform integrate the different subsystems and uh, provide also the interface, the deployer and the interface with the rocket. And then I have to acknowledge, publicly acknowledge uh, Bernardo Canicero, Massimiliano Pastena for the technical support that they have provided during the development of the mission and a number of advices, support to ESA testing facilities, etc. And then in a nutshell, summarizing the results from FSSCAT. So FSSCAT was not a technology demo even though we tested a number of technologies, the goal was to do some science. And here you have the summary, okay, of the different products that we were able to, to achieve, soil moisture products over the Northern Hemisphere, okay. Uh, we did, we test several combinations, microwave only, microwave plus ENSSR, GNSSR, and also in combination with the uh, optical in order to produce a downscale product. On the top right, what you have is the sea ice extent and coverage, L4 product. So here you have Arctic, Antarctica, and this is the, the, the boundary that is determined by the microwave radiometer. And overlaid on top of that, you see the, some tracks, okay, for the reflectometry. And you see that basically the color changes because of the uh, different types of ice and the change in the color shows the change in the reflectivity. And it, of course, if the dense, uh, if the number of tracks was higher, you can delineate much uh, better where the contour of the ice is. Here we have a, a, another map. This one is of sea ice thickness, up to 60 centimeters. It worked uh, very well. So you see now the evolution of, over time and how the different tracks were acquired. And on the bottom left, you have a salinity map in the Arctic and in Antarctica, okay? Which uh, this product was even obtained after the mission and the whole project was, uh, was over because it was uh, more difficult to get. Alinsat one, a three unit uh, CubeSat. So on, on UPC, uh, my students, again, uh, they, when they made the proposal, I was not uh, even aware of it, but anyway, they, they succeed, they are performing very, very well. In it, the payload includes a multi-spectral camera, actually it's a very spectral camera because it has 25 bands, three patches for a microwave radiometer at l band, and a bigger patch uh, for LoRa communications. Our payloads in FM, uh, GNSS uh, AS satellite include basically four monopoles, okay, that are combined by pairs. So we have an antenna at UHF and another one at VHF. This is for the ionospheric scintillation experiment. The whole payload, including the reflectometer, is in here. And the RF board is over here. But again, this one was manufactured 
by this spin-off company that I mentioned before, Balanis. And this is uh, basically, okay, uh, KubeCat 8. KubeCat 8, that will include this deployable antenna, the deployer for pocket cubes, the, uh, the thruster, okay, the ionic thruster, and this is the, the deployer that has already been uh, developed in-house. And I want to, to highlight also that the pocket cubes that will be being deployed from here, if we manage to get the launch, will be replicas of some, uh, what we call the IEEE Open Pocket Cube Kit, okay? Uh, under the generic name of POCATS, instead of pocket, a POCAT, okay? These uh, pocket cubes are truly uh, small satellites, five, uh, well, actually, pico satellites, five centimeters size, but with all the different subsystems. We have an EPS, we have a COMS and OVC on board computer board. We have an uh, attitude determination and control system with magnetorkers integrated in the, in the, in the sides and uh, underneath the, the solar panels. And the top board is for the payload. And we are developing three different payloads. We expect to finalize this in about uh, before the next summer. We are having some delays because it's getting more and more difficult to get some of the components. So as to conclude, uh, I have tried to give you a, a summary of, this, of the projects that we have been developing over the past 30 years. Uh, most of them in the field of passive microwave remote sensing which basically was the, the, the perfect fit for the CubeSat missions that we developed afterwards. Because CubeSats are limited in power, they are limited also in the uh, amount of data that you can download. So it, the, the, basically we found our fit very nicely, okay? Because I mean, we are not doing optical remote sensing, we are not doing astronomy, we are not doing, so we, we found our, our place, okay? And the other good thing about that is that passive microwave tends to be uh, cheaper. So basically, we have been able to develop all these basically uh, with uh, undergraduate, masters, and PhD students with modest budgets, not zero, but modest, okay? A fraction of uh, what is being uh, expected for other uh, missions in other places, okay? I want also to emphasize that these student teams can do great things if they are given a chance. So I, I will encourage anyone that has uh, university responsibilities or funding responsibilities to, to create the necessary conditions for these things to happen. Because I mean, this is our next generation. We will need them, okay? And in our lab, we have already trained several hundreds of students and they are well demanded by, by companies and institutions, not just local. They are nearly everywhere in, in the world. And I would like also, as the last comment, to thank ESA and ESA Academy for the opportunities that they have given in the Flyer Satellite, Vexus, and of course, in the S3 Challenge in the Copernicus Masters Competition that we, uh, that we won in the year 2017. So, I think that's it. Thank you for your attention. If you, if you have questions, I will be happy to answer. And if you want uh, more information, you can go and check uh, in our website directly. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was super inspiring. Um, we have about seven minutes for questions. So if you have questions, you can raise your virtual hand or if you'd prefer, you can type them into the chat and I will read them. I guess while we wait for questions to come in, since you ended in uh, this call for people to make a space for students to do this type of work and, and your lab evolved from sort of this component level or your university from this component level thing into the systems thing, do you think there is a critical mass in terms of size that this undertaking needs to be to get people from these sort of one-off component student projects to actually doing the systems? And is that like, 20 people, 100 people? Okay, that's a good question. I think, uh, I mean, 
uh, what, what has happened actually is that not all the people that we are doing systems are now doing, I'm uh, sorry, subsystems, okay, are doing now uh, sensors or remote sensors or even less cubesets, okay? They keep doing their own things. They keep working for the automotive industry or for the communications industry and so on, okay? That's, but it's extremely convenient, okay, to be next to them because whenever we need, okay, to test the antenna, okay, the facilities are there and we can go. Of course, we collaborate. I mean, it's not that you just basically benefit, okay? It has to be a mutual benefit. For example, we have nearby uh, in the electronics department, there is another clean room where they have developed, they, they even grow the, the, the semiconductors. So in some of the cubes admissions, okay, we have put their uh, solar cells, their uh, uh, monatomic oxygen detector and things like that. Okay, so it's not, you don't have to have really, really in house, but it's very convenient to have them next to you. In the electronics department, they also have the uh, uh, a Faraday chamber, okay, to do the EMI tests, EMI. So this is also very convenient. We don't have, but I mean, it's just uh, like 20 meters in, in a straight line uh, through the window. So it's very, very convenient to have all these facilities on campus. And this is what we have tried, okay. Critical mass, uh, I mean, to start the remote sensors, Probably at the very beginning, we were just three PET physics, and it has grown over time. Okay, and for the CubeSats, probably with two, two people, two, three people, you can do it. That's but amazing. That will be the very, very minimum. And then lots of students, uh, dedicated students. Any other questions? I guess I'll ask another one while we wait. I guess, you know, you talked, oh, Saibon has a question. All right, Saibon. Thank you, Adriano. Uh, quick question for you. Um, in terms of the preparation for students, I, I like the idea of training next generation of scientists. What kind of uh, background your student has in order to be able to participate in the project? For example, what kind of courses they, they have that they, are they taking at UPC or at other places? Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, as you know, I am based in the School of Telecommunications Engineering, okay? But again, on campus, and that's also why I emphasize all this, okay? We have the School of, uh, it's, we call it Informatics, but it's actually, you call it Computer Science, okay? Also in our school in telecommunications, we also have the Electronics, okay? And we don't have on campus, but uh, let's say we have close ties to other two campuses where do you have the aeronautic engineers. And in the South campus, we have the industrial engineers. The industrial engineers are very good for the mechanical design, for the thermal analysis. Aeronautics are outstanding for uh, everything that is related to attitude determination and control, okay? Uh, electronics are wonderful basically for everything that has to do with, uh, with uh, PCBs, etc. Telecommunications engineers, we are uh, like orchestra mans, okay, or men. We we do a little bit of everything, but we do not program well. We do we do not do PCBs well, etc. But we have a little bit more like a system uh, view, okay. And then of course the the computer scientists, they are the ones that program the best. So in the lab, actually we have uh, we welcome all students from all the degrees. Okay, and I think that this is in a so like in a soccer team. Okay, everyone can bring their best. Not everybody has to be uh, making goals. You need a goalkeeper, someone to defend, etc. So it's a teamwork, and we need uh, all these expertise. It's not just about telecommunications or electronics, Saibun. Uh, you need a little bit more broader. Wonderful. Thanks, Adriano. Well, on that note, we have one minute left. I will remind people once again that we have an open slot in next month's webinar. So if you think of somebody who'd be great, please drop me an email. And thank you again, Adriano, for coming and presenting. Um, I'm certainly super excited to, to try and find people to do things like this now after watching this talk. Thank you very much, Justin. See you all and next you month. Have, thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. And if you have uh, questions, just send me an email. It's this hour. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to you, Adriano. Bye now.
ठीक है बाय बाय